so let's move on then to our last talk, last but not least, of course. Um, so the last talk's going to be delivered by Simon Moore. Um, Simon's currently a professor at the University of Cambridge. He's got extensive experience within sort of computer architecture and interests that uh, encompass the hardware and software interface and hardware security. So I'm really pleased he agreed to speak today about Ch uh, Cherry and specifically Cherry Risk Five for us. Simon, over to you. Thank you, Dan. Um, thank you for earlier speakers giving uh, really useful uh, background info information about memory safety. Uh, so yeah, today I'm going to try and uh, cram in a short talk, giving you a bit of an overview of uh, Cherry-based uh, memory protection for both spatial and temporal memory safety. Uh, we originally did this work actually on MIPS. Uh, we've been working on a RISC-V version for the last few years. Um, and we're also look, working with ARM on transitioning that technology. And there have been a lot of people involved in this project, uh, many of them listed there. Um, thanks to sponsors. So the basic agenda is, so I'm just gonna move the Zoom thing over. There we go. Um, so give you a bit of motivation, tell you about, uh, you know, concretely what Cherry uh, RISC-V hardware looks like. Uh, talk a little bit about software models at a high level. Uh, actually, my colleague Robert Watson is giving an invited talk at the main chess conference. So if you want to know more about the software models, do attend that. Um, I'll tell you about some of the uh, risk 5 calls we've uh, created and then wrap up with exploitation paths and conclusions. So background, uh, you know, memory safety is a really big deal. Uh, and, you know, for applications and operating systems and so on, you get a lot of memory safety uh, vulnerabilities. And so, you know, just give you two examples, you know, Matt Miller from Microsoft Response Center said that basically over the sort of last 20 odd years, something like 70% of all of Microsoft's vulnerabilities have been memory safety bugs. And in first place, very much spatial memory safety, and then uh, second place, uh, use after free type bugs, so temporal memory safety. And uh, Cherry directly addresses the first and really helps to address the second. But it's just not, not just Microsoft. See the same thing if you say, look at Chromium browser, uh, there again, about 70% of all their serious security bugs were memory safety problems. So how are we gonna go about solving this? So the basic Cherry approach is as follows. Firstly, we have this idea of this sort of principle of intentional use. So we want to ensure that software runs the way the programmer intended and not the way the attacker tried to trick it. Um, the way we actually go about this is to have a guaranteed pointer integrity and provenance and very efficient bounds checking uh, on those pointers using a mechanism we'll call capabilities, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. Um, uh, we also are very specific about, you know, intentional use of those capabilities. And I'll also tell you more about that in a minute. Another aspect is the principle of least privilege. So we want to reduce the attack surface using compartmentalization techniques. And um, Cherry gives us very efficient ways of describing uh, different sorts of compartments. And finally, it should be noted that we're really interested in deterministic protection. So there are quite a lot of other techniques out there that rely on statistical approaches to, you know, to help uh, reduce uh, memory safety vulnerabilities. But the usual problem with deterministic approaches or statistical approaches is that there's usually some way of bypassing them. And we really want to avoid that. So in terms of implementing this, um, we really want to sort of stay within the risk philosophy. So we don't want to have, you know, uh, microcode or new lookup tables or exotic, exotic memories or a really sort of extending the pipeline a lot or reducing the clock frequency. We don't want to reduce addressing modes and so on. Um, also uh, somewhat related, uh, for this cherry work, we don't rely on cryptography at all. It's just not needed. I mean, crypto has its place. Uh, but, uh, you know, just to say, obviously, you can have security, uh, or you know, secure hardware without using crypto. 
And we want, yes, to uh, you know, low-level hardware functionality on which uh, many software com structures can be built. We want it to be compiler-friendly. And we want to get the compiler, the link, uh, and the runtime system to do much of the work, um, not just you know, ISA plus the decoder. And finally, we want to keep it as simple as possible. So how do we go about this? So let me tell you about the basic principles hardware principles by Cherry, and then we'll see how we build things on top of it. So we've got a new type, uh, the capability. So a capability is a bounds check pointer with integrity uh, in the Cherry world. Uh, capabilities are held in memory and in extended integer registers. So we start with an address, 64-bit address. There's also a 32-bit variant. We then add further 64 bits of metadata that uh, are part of that, that include permissions, compressed bounds, and uh, a sealed bit that I'll tell you more about in a minute. Oh, and a hidden validity tag. Uh, the hidden validity tag, actually, it's kind of funny when you start talking to process architects, they hate this validity tag, but we've demonstrated that it's very easy to support with conventional memory. So more later. The basic idea is that those compressed bounds just indicate what region of memory uh, that address can refer to. Um, and that gives it, it's a very simple low level mechanism on which we can build many things. To go with this capability, we add to, uh, just a few new instructions. So we add very specific load and store instructions that work with uh, bounds check capabilities. And you get an exception if you try to dereference a capability where the address is out of range. We have guarded manipulation of capabilities so we can decrease bounds, decrease permissions, adjust the, uh, the address and extract or test fields. The decreasing bounds and permissions are absolutely critical to the security properties here. So monotonic decrease in writes uh, is something that we formally verified uh, in the ISA, since it is so critical for the security. We also have a sealed mode, uh, which I'm going to just give you a very quick overview. So sealed capabilities are non-dereferenceable capabilities, i.e. you can't use them directly to point at something to, to access it. They have to be unsealed first, typically when you do a compartment transition uh, in order to use it. And the main thing is we add a 24-bit object type and we further compress the bounds to make that possible. And we set the sealed bit to indicate that it's a sealed capability. And we use this during uh, compartment transitions. So we, when we're transitioning from one compartment to another, uh, you start off with the sealed code capability uh, together with the sealed data capability. So that gives you a pointer to your code and a pointer to the data space. And the C invoke instruction basically unpacks those. It checks that the object types match and you then end up with a program counter capability and a uh, data capability. And using this low level mechanism, you can build lots of different compartmentalization models, which I will skim over today. We don't have time. That'll be another talk in itself. So let's just quickly tell you about some of the software models. I think it's worth bearing in mind that, uh, you know, when you add some low level support like this, Software can use it in many different ways. Uh, so, you know, it's sort of a machine level. It's a very simple mechanism. But if you think about it, it just like, um, you know, we use TLBs, for instance, to make virtual memory uh, much faster. Now, the processor, in some sense, doesn't really understand virtual memory in all of its nuances. I mean, for instance, the processor has no idea what a guard page is. That's a software construct that just simply makes use of the paging mechanism. And uh, in many ways, Cherry is even more so. So once you've got these very low level mechanisms, you can build all sorts of different software constructs on the top. And we can use Cherry in different modes. So um, we can really sort of, on the one hand, be uh, have unmodified code running 
uh, basically legacy binaries where all pointers are integers. And that means you can just run, you know, legacy stuff. Um, but you don't really get any security benefits at all. Then at the other extreme, we can just recompile all the code and using our compiler, uh, all pointers are turned into capabilities and you actually get an awful lot of protection just by recompiling the code. And we also have a hybrid mode where you can sort of interoperate uh, between using integer pointers and capabilities. Um, and that's particularly useful when you, uh, for instance, want to uh, interface a legacy or wrap a legacy library uh, to have a capability interface, or if you want to interoperate between a legacy operating system and a capability aware application. And finally, we have a very good compiler support now uh, that generates code for all three models. We tend to focus on the pure capability side. Uh, that's where we tend to use things, where we recompile everything. And of course, at this point, you end up with uh, all your pointers being capabilities. So of course, as soon as you want to call the OS, you have to do so using capabilities. And so you need a cherry aware ABI in much the same way, you know, you say got a 64-bit uh, OS and you want to run 32-bit binaries, you need a 32-bit aware ABI. And here we could have, you know, a cherry ABI running on a legacy 64-bit OS, uh, providing a compatibility layer. And more recently, we've been adding uh, very good capability support directly into the FreeBSD operating system. So in which case you have a native Cherry ABI layer, and you can then have 32-bit and 64-bit compatibility layers to that pure capability OS. We've done lots of evaluation work, but there's just one example here where we uh, sort of uh, slightly earlier on in the project uh, when Heartbleed was a new exploit, uh, there was a, an evaluation team uh, in DARPA speaker red team at MIT Lincoln Labs, and they'd taken our stuff, recompiled Heartbleed, and lo and behold, uh, Heart Cherry just mitigated Heartbleed without having to make any further software changes at all, which was a good start. We also used Cherry to uh, give us more robustness against control flow attacks. So we, uh, we actually not only use uh, capabilities as pointers to data, but we also use them as pointers to code. So if you put a capability on a stack, so a return address on the stack, um, if you uh, trick the code to overwrite that with data, then it automatically becomes, it, it invalidates that return address. It is no longer a valid capability. Similarly, if you uh, put a, you know, a pointer to some data, there, it is no longer an executable capability, so you wouldn't be able to return from it. So that gives us quite a lot of control flow robustness. The other thing that's very powerful about the uh, Cherry model is uh, very efficient compartmentalization. You can effectively have, you can isolate compartments using um, sort of sets or graphs of capabilities. So, you know, you can have one protection domain where that has one set of capabilities. You can have another protection domain that has a different set of capabilities and potentially also very efficiently share data uh, between those protection domains uh, as appropriate. Temple memory safety uh, isn't directly provided by the hardware, however, because we now have um, this validity tag on every single pointer, it becomes much easier to uh, quickly scan memory and identify where the pointers are and to revoke references uh, to memory regions that have been deallocated, thereby mitigating use after free vulnerabilities. So, um, and I'll show you some data in just a minute. We've got a couple of papers on this already and it's a work in progress. Um, the current data indicates that we've really got state-of-the-art uh, runtime overheads so of incredibly low overheads, um, even using the cornucopia system. And we're looking at reducing the overheads even further. 
so you can have very strong temporal memory safety for very little cost. Okay, so let's just sort of summarize the capability protections that we have, and then we'll look at uh, hardware. So you get integrity and provenance, uh, you get bounds checking, you get monotonicity, so you can't increase your privileges, and you get very strong checking of permissions. So for instance, you can't accidentally, you know, execute some data uh, or vice versa. So let's just quickly talk about some of the implementations that we've done. We've done sort of, you know, tablet type uh, demonstrations, which are quite useful to wield around at uh, poster sessions and things. We've done a number of implementations. So um, we, our early work was on MIPS. Our current work is on RISC-V and on RISC-V we have, uh, you know, a fairly short pipeline, 32-bit uh, microcontroller called Piccolo. We've got Flute, which actually works 64-bit or 32-bit, which is more of a classic RISC pipeline, but still very much a scalar core. And then we have Tuba, which is an out-of-order core based on MIT's RISC-E uh, OO core. Um, and that's quite interesting. We've been using that at the moment to explore uh, the sort of intersection of uh, cherry features and uh, mitigation of um, transient execution attacks like spectrum meltdown. We've also been doing a lot of work on sort of specification and test. I mentioned that we've got a, a formal method angle to this. <clears throat> been working with my colleague Peter Sewell and others in his group on a language called SAIL, which can be used to describe um, formal models of instruction sets. And in fact, the SAIL risk five model has now been ratified by um, by risk five and is now the official formal specification. There's also a Cherry version that uh, <clears throat> we've made publicly available, um, should you want to look at that. And we've also been, uh, as hardware engineers, we've also got a system test rig that where we can uh, run testing against this executable model and our implementations, which has proven to be quite useful. And that's also open source. Lots of work on the tool chain and operating system support. So we now have really good compiler support. We've got OF, really good operating system support. So Cherry on top of FreeBSD and FreeRTOS. Um, and we generally find we get you know, little to no software modification required if you port all sorts of you know, Unix tools, for instance, you know, everything from LS to grep and all sorts of things. Um, but we've also been trying much larger applications as well. And more recently, um, you know, porting large systems libraries, um, you know, tools like Postgres, SQL, Nginx, WebKit, and uh, also, you know, GUI-based stuff. So an X11 client and QT, all with very strong uh, Cherry uh, memory protection support. And actually requiring very little work to port. In fact, most of the work often is just like finding and um, getting rid of the bugs that Cherry throws up. Um, let me just wrap up by talking about exploitation paths. So we have a um, big chunk of funding from UK government. Uh, so 70 million with a further 170 million of uh, industry matched funding to um, really push the Cherry technology out of the door. Uh, we've been working with ARM on a, a system called Morello, which is a, a demonstrator platform. And uh, in fact, they're expecting the chips back very soon from TSMC. So that's a cutting edge, you know, seven nanometer process uh, based on their ARM Neoverse N1 core. So it'll be a quad core system with a GPU and so on. So it's quite a serious chip on board. And those will be going out, uh, those evaluation chips and boards will be going out to industry and academic partners to uh, evaluate the Cherry technology on ARM. Um, and as I mentioned, my colleague, uh, Robert Watson is giving an invited talk at Chairs. And he'll, if you want to know more about ARM Morello, do go to that. I'm very interested in the RISC-V side. And uh, one of the things that's been interesting with working with ARM, actually they've agreed that they will not patent anything in this space. 
Uh, or if they do, they will then relinquish the, the IP, which is quite amazing. Um, that was been part of the way we've worked all the way along. So very, very, very keen on open source, very keen on getting the ideas out there absolutely everywhere. So you'll find that our calls are available, um, uh, open source, the documentation, the formal specs, the simulators, compilers, operating system stuff, it's all out there. We've made it all available. Right, so let me wrap up, because we must be running out of time. Um, so Cherry provides hardware with, in a sense that the hardware sort of ends up with more semantic knowledge of what the programmer intended. And it really pushes us towards this idea of the principle of intentional use. So the code is much more likely to run exactly as the programmer intended, not the way the attacker tricked it. We have this uh, capabilities give us very efficient pointer integrity and bounds checking. And that eliminates things like buffer overflows and buff buffer over read attacks. You know, finally, I mean, these are vulnerabilities have been around a long time and, uh, you know, we just have to get rid of them. It gives us very deterministic protection. There's no statistical uh, techniques involved here. We get proven, scalable, and efficient compartmentalization. And this is really very powerful because you can then, um, it's a mechanism that allows software to sort of exploit the principle of least privilege. And we know that um, if you can really you do fine-grained compartmentalization, you can mitigate both known and many unknown attacks. And it gives us vast performance improvement over process-based compartmentalization that we currently see in things like the Chromium browser, but also in iOS and so on. And finally, we're working with industry and the open source community to deploy the technology. And it's great to be able to talk today uh, to you all because we're really socially socializing the ideas with the Risk Five community. And we're looking, we'll be looking in the next year or so to uh, ways that we can um, get Cherry standardized. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot, Simon. Um, we have a, a few minutes for questions if there are any. So straight away in the chat. So Marcel asks, would it be possible to create some crafted tag in a buffer overflow for a desired return address in hybrid mode? What's the barrier stopping us? Yeah, so you, there's no way you can access the tag memory directly from code and you can only um, basically generate a capability from another capability. So the only way you can possibly set that validity tag is to start with a valid capability to begin with. And the instruction set absolutely guarantees you can't break that model. So I've got a quick question maybe. I mean, you mentioned be working on this for quite some time and you know the the concept and the a lot of the engineering is pretty mature so if, if someone's interested in working in this space maybe is, is there anything you haven't done it seems like you've you've really uh, touched every part of the stack basically are there any gaps touched a you... lot i mean there are there are things we're working on at present um so uh you know we've looked a little bit about trusted execution environment but it'd be great to do more in that space. Um, we've done some work uh, exploring um, how we can use Cherry to uh, mitigate uh, transient execution attacks. But in some sense, we almost make that problem harder because, because obviously we want um, more compartments. That's part of the sort of direction we're going. Uh, to you know, use the principle of least privilege, but as soon as you've got more compartments, you've got more protection domain transitions. So if you like, there's potentially more opportunities uh, to leak information. And so you know, very efficient techniques um, to do uh, to mitigate transient execution attacks are going to be quite critical. Um, so that's just some of the areas. Um, but we also want to work with people on you know, standardizing Cherry. And also there are, there, you know, there are other things that people are doing that are orthogonal to Cherry in the RISC-V space. And we want to make sure that Cherry composes well with those. 
Um, and so one of the things we haven't yet looked at, but we need to is simply the, the new vector instructions. We need to make sure that Cherry works really well with those, which we believe that they do, but we really need to do all the, uh, you know, the engineering work to ensure that really is the case. So maybe one last question before we, we call it a close from Ravi who asks, do we have estimates on the hardware or area cost to incorporate the Cherry uh, concept or capability into a, a call? Yeah, it varies a lot actually. Um, so uh, it's probably most expensive on really small calls uh, because Apart from anything else, we make the integer register file twice as wide. Um, and on a small call, that's sort of noticeable. Um, once you start getting up to uh, more of a superscalar processor, it's much less of an issue. Um, but it's, it's, it's a tricky one to answer because I think you really need to look at the overall system costs. And the other thing that's even more confusing is you know, people start adding uh, other hardware mechanisms to um, improve security. And once you've added Cherry, you may not need those mechanisms. So there's also the question, both, both in hardware and in software. So even something like, you know, address space layout randomization that software tends to use comes with some cost. It's really not clear that you need that once you have Cherry. Um, so I'm not going to give you a straight answer, is, I think is the simple one. Uh, I think for super scalar cores, we'll look at the sort of overall system overhead of below 5%. But that's when you include caches and various other things. Uh, you know, if you've got a really tiny core, you could easily be talking a 30% overhead. But are you measuring the right thing at that point? Um, the other thing though, on terms of overheads, that's really critical is in terms of execution time, it tends to have a very low overhead. Uh, and in fact, the, the most overhead we see in terms of performance is that the, because we have bigger pointers, that does impact cash footprint. So you get a, some hit because of cash pressure. Um, but as I said, typically, performance overhead is well below 5% and often below 1% for many applications. Okay, great. So we're close to being bang on time. So I'm tempted to say we draw a line there. So, so sorry for any questions that, that, that I miss out, but bearing in mind there's this talk tomorrow by Robert, maybe we can uh, call it a day there and say thanks, Simon, for that. Yeah, I think he's talking on Thursday. Oh, Thursday, is it? Sorry. I think it was Thursday, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's down to me to, to say a few closing remarks. I, I don't have too many, but for sure, I want to say um, some thanks, um, particularly to the speakers 